HBO had a great documentary on Charles Darwin where they juxtaposed his life story and his biography with creationists talking about creationism and why they disagree with him. So Gawker put together the parts where the creationists are talking. It's a little long, but let's listen to the whole thing because it's worth it, and then we'll talk about it. If somewhere within the Bible, I were to find a passage that said 2 plus 2 equals 5, I wouldn't question what I'm reading in the Bible. I would believe it, accept it as true, and then do my best to work it out and to understand it. I can't even fathom coming from this little thing that crawled on the ground to apes to being human. It, it just doesn't, it, it sounds crazy to me. When you have generations of people being taught that evolution's fact, and therefore Genesis is not true and you have to reinterpret the Bible, why shouldn't we do what we want to do? There's no absolutes, therefore we determine what is right and what is wrong. To put man down as just an animal that were no different than a dog, a horse, an elephant, or a cat, or anything else, is totally preposterous. God made us in his image. And so to say that man is, a, is an animal, and God created man in his own image, so does one come back and say, are you saying God is nothing more than an animal? What that does, it puts God so remote <laughs> that we can safely ignore him. He's way back at the Big Bang, and he really hasn't done much since. And here's another issue we need to think about. What's more basic to Christianity than prayer? Prayer is a case where we actually have an opportunity and are invited to do so by our Father uh, to speak to God. Why bother pursuing a relationship with God if he's, if he's closed the door on us and doesn't care about us anymore? To think that I had no communication with God would be so devastating. I can't even imagine uh, adopting such a view just to make peace with Darwin. If that's the way the world works, if it is just uh, this mechanical thing that God sets spinning in place, then you believe in a God that doesn't intervene in nature, that takes away any possibility of miracles, any possibility of answered prayer, any possibility of the resurrection. And in, uh, in reality, you take away the possibility of Christianity to be true at all. I would love to encourage Mr. Darwin and others that feel just like him to try God. and see the transformation for themselves. If I were asked, what is the primary reason I believe evolution is incompatible with biblical Christianity, uh, I could sum it up in one word for you, death. If you want, add pain, suffering, and death. I know a little about this. I lost my first wife to cancer, and now my second wife has cancer, and so do I. Whether we're young or old, uh, death is inevitable. And how do we deal with death? How does evolution deal with death? From just reading Genesis, you get the idea of a perfect world, no death, no disease. Animals, man, the dinosaurs were all vegetarian. Now the fossil record, it's a record of death. It's a record of animals eating each other. It's a record of disease because there are dinosaur bones with brain tumors. But you can't have dinosaurs with brain tumors and dinosaurs eating each other until after sin. I was raised and I believe that the Bible is fact. So if something's gonna collide with it, then it's obviously incorrect and false. I think sometimes our culture has like a overly hev hev heavy reliance on like science. Christianity is, is more than science and scientific proof. Have you guys ever been in a, a situation where you've been articulating your faith and it was met with mockery? It should never surprise us that we we're mocked or hated by the world. I mean, Christ said that this would happen and it's happening, so. I have to say, and I'm willing to say, you know, that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are, are true and correct because it's, it's, it's God's Word. There's so much to get to there, man. That's all so, so interesting. So first of all, I want to make a distinction between uh, the older people there who came earlier on and then the kids at the end. 
honestly, I think the kids are just a result of pure and simple indoctrination. You could tell by their responses that they're very stock. Like, these things have been the things that are hammered into their heads, or they're going to regurgitate it when a question is asked that evokes that response or invokes that response. So, there's that... There's the, that two-tiered thing going on where I'll get to the older people in a second, but the younger kids, it just appears like indoctrination. And I also see that they think there's this victimhood and they think that they're persecuted. Well, first of all, Christians are 76% of the population in the United States of America. So that's just out the window right away. You're the overwhelming majority. Every single president has been Christian. Okay, maybe they're not as gung-ho about it as you. Maybe they're not actually, you know, Bible literalists and creationists. But you're not persecuted by any stretch of the imagination. And by, and I should, I should reference this because some Christians think, you know, I'm personally attacking them. No, no, no. I'm attacking your ideas, which I disagree with because they are not factual. And I'm trying to explain the truth to you. It's got nothing to do with anything personal. My feelings and your feelings are irrelevant in a debate about the nature of the world. We need to focus just on the nature of the world, but they need to twist it into, oh, he's a bad guy, oh, he's personally attacking me, oh, I'm a victim, because they know that they can't win on the substance, okay? And then also, just, oh, there was an, we have uh, an over, over-reliance on science in this country. Uh, okay, so when you get sick, are you going to go to the doctor? I take it you're not, right? I take it you didn't get any vaccines. I take it you never have Tylenol. I take it you never took penicillin when you got strep throat or had some other infection. Um, I mean, science has given us the camera that they were talking into. Science and technology gave that to us. You know, when we went to the moon, that was NASA. The internet is from science and technology. I mean, the list of things, the heat in your house that makes it so you don't die from being too cold in the winter, science and technology. The air conditioner, science and technology. The comfy bed you sleep in, just with how tight the springs are and how they make you feel when you lay down on it and the fluffiness of your pillow and the TV that you watch two and a half hours a day. All science and technology. The fact that you are you live to an average age now of about 80 years, science and technology. 300 years ago, people were croaking at the age of 40. And probably even younger than that. All right, we owe almost everything to science, man. And the more we actually go down this road of science and empiricism, the more we will improve this life as we know it. We have a chance to turn this world into as close to a heaven on earth as humanly possible. We could try to eliminate poverty, eliminate starvation, make people happy and comfortable and fulfilled. And the way we do that is through thinking more scientifically and problem solving. But these guys think there's an over-reliance on science because they want to stick their head in their dogmatic book, which there's no goddamn evidence for, and it's no different from the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or the Roman gods or the Greek gods or the rest of them, and it's sad. Okay? And look, just, I know I'm, I'm going over time here, but let me, let me, let me be quick with it, because the earlier parts say a lot. Uh, 2 plus 2 equals 5. That comment says it all right there. The guy's telling you, I will pick the Bible over reality. Now, why is he doing that? He's doing that because he has defined the Bible as reality. So it's a definitional thing to him, where the Bible is right by definition. So even if it says something that we know is not true, like 2 plus 2 equals 5, I will blind myself to what you're showing me is obvious, and I will pick the thing that's wrong. Okay, that's a scary way to think because that's exactly how the people think that strap on the fucking suicide vest and are part of the Taliban or Al-Qaeda and think they're going to see the 72 versions later. Because there's no amount of evidence you could tell them to explain this is a bad idea, you're not going to go anywhere, you're just going to stop existing afterwards, you need to sit down and relax, let's go get a sandwich, let's talk this out. Because, But they get indoctrinated, so they believe, even though this can't be true, I think it's true. That's the same kind of thinking. 2 plus 2 equals 5. I'll pick that over 2 plus 2 equals 4, even though we can show you that this and this equals this. It's crazy. Uh, and then also, I, t I took away that they're authoritarians. Every single one of them. They don't do well with nuance, and they need certainty in order to sleep at night. They're uncomfortable with the idea of uncertainty later on in their life or right now, so they need this this feeling of religion and God and Jesus as a blanket, a metaphorical blanket that, that goes over them at night and tucks them in and tells them that they're special. So they're authoritarians. They need this higher force which guides them as opposed to using their own minds. Uh, and one part I actually agreed with, but the guy didn't realize he was making our case for us. The guy said, well, if you, if you believe in Darwinism, Christianity pretty much crumbles because then how do we know what parts of the Bible are true if this part here is not true? That's right. That's right. It was, and it's true that 
Darwinism does make Christianity crumble. It's not true that you need to ignore Darwinism and focus on Christianity, even though it's been disproven, essentially. And then, um, final, final things. I'm really over time, but they say, uh, uh, the one of the women goes, I would tell evolutionists, just try God. And what she's saying is, try God and you'll feel better. But what she's not understanding is we're having two different conversations. You're talking about how to feel better, okay? God might make you feel better, you know? But we're talking about what is true. What is the reality? Does God exist or does God not exist? Is Christianity true or is it not true? Let's evaluate the evidence. Let's evaluate the proof and let's figure out what's going on here. And the answer is it's not true, okay? So you're picking your religion to make you feel better and say, okay, well, this, you know, this, it's got to be real because it makes me feel good. Bullshit! You know what makes me feel good? Vicodin. Does that mean that Vicodin is the end-all be-all and I should create a religion around it and it's truth? No, it just makes you feel good. There's a difference between truth and, and making you feel good. And then finally, the biggest point here, and the guy, I, feel, I felt bad for him as he was talking. He lost one wife to cancer, his wife now has cancer, and he has cancer. And he said, death is the reason why I'm a Christian. I don't know what happens after I die. I'm scared of that idea. I'm terrified of that idea. And I want to sympathize with him and tell him, dude, None of us know what happens when we die. And we're all in this weird, crazy thing called life right now together. And it's a temporary state of existence. We all know it's a temporary state of existence. And it's something that we all struggle with. But to make up answers to fill in the void is just making up answers at, at its deepest level, at its base level. And that doesn't make the stuff true. So... Uh, and he's right that we don't have an answer. Evolutionists don't have an answer. Atheists and agnostics don't have an answer. But our lack of having an answer is the reason why, when it, when it comes to actually being alive, we want to make everything we can out of this life because we think that when we die, it's most likely the case that we just go back to what it was like for us in the year 1790. Do you remember what 1790 was like? Yeah, I don't either because I didn't fucking exist in 1790. Just as when I die, I won't fucking exist. So yes, it's all it's scary and it's creepy and it's awkward and this is all temporary and all that all that stuff. But that's all the more reason to to help people out in this life, be more moral in this life, create a better world for everybody in this life, connect with people in this life, and make this life worth living. So you don't have to delay gratification to the next life, which probably isn't going to come anyway.